All through the heyday of the analog recording era, serious audio and music production happened in high-end multi-track studios under the auspices of professional engineers and producers. In the late 70s and 80s, smaller, usually four-track, multi-track open reel and cassette recorders offered an alternative, but it wasn't until the advent of digital audio that music production moved from the big studios to small or home studios. These were dubbed project studios, and the resulting project studio revolution changed audio and music production for good. In the early 90s, the introduction of the ADAT modular digital recorder brought the cost of setting up a multi-track recording studio down to a level almost anyone could afford. The release of Pro Tools went a step further, allowing for not only digital multi-track recording, but also mixing and processing within a standard computer. Pro Tools' early use of add-on circuit boards made for an initial high cost, but as computer power increased exponentially, systems that didn't require extra hardware cut the cost of in-the-box production drastically. This native computer-based processing became the new standard, and nowadays, for the cost of a computer, a little software, and a few additional essentials, like mic and speakers, it's possible to assemble a project or home studio that has all the tools needed for fully professional production. The only thing required to take advantage of all these available and affordable resources is the expertise to set it all up and operate it, which, of course, is the subject of this course. A modern project studio consists of several components. Inside the box, the computer, the DAW software, and any additional software for extra sounds, virtual instruments, and processing. And outside the box, microphones for recording acoustic sounds, speakers and headphones for monitoring, and a suitable room. Additional optional external components might include analog hardware processors, which may provide more warmth and presence than purely software tools, and external instruments like specific analog or digital synthesizers, drum machines, and even sequencers, prized for their unique sounds, processing capabilities, and hands-on access for creative performance. The course will touch on all of these components in the following videos, but first I want to mention the one that's often given short shrift when setting up a project or home studio, the monitoring environment, including the room. Naturally, every studio operator needs to listen to the audio continuously throughout a project. While a lot of music listening these days is done on earbuds, for serious audio and music production, if you want it to sound good not just to you but to others, monitoring over speakers is universally preferred, especially for mixing. The headphone listening experience may offer a more subtle detail, but some of that can be lost when a mix is then heard over speakers. On the other hand, mixes done on speakers usually translate well to headphones. The speakers themselves should be studio monitors rather than home hi-fi speakers or computer speakers. Studio monitors are designed to have a flat, neutral, unhyped tonal balance, which is necessary to make decisions about the balance of parts in a mix and tonal adjustments like EQ. The speakers don't have to be big. Monitors with 6 to 8 inch woofers offer adequate bass response, and they shouldn't be run too loud. The whole point is for the sound from the monitors to be an accurate representation of the sound of what's actually being recorded or mixed, and not to enhance it in any way. But when mixing and mastering, it's good to also check the work on additional playback systems. Small cheap speakers, computer speakers, studio quality headphones, earbuds, and even car stereos. A good mix or master needs to work on all of these if it's to be distributed to, and sound good to, the public, who may be listening on all sorts of sound systems. Though it's often overlooked, the room is just as important as the monitors. Sound wave reflections in any room change the balance of what you're hearing with significant, potentially problematic results. It's beyond the scope of this course to get into all the details, but I'll offer a few suggestions for setting up a project studio environment. Avoid rooms with similar dimensions, like ones where length and width are the same, or worst case, a room which is a cube. Avoid having too many reflective surfaces near the front of the room. Many studios put up absorptive foam in the front and even to the sides, leaving the rear of the room to be reflective. Position the studio monitors symmetrically between the side walls and keep them a couple of feet away from any walls to minimize problems with irregular bass response. Set up the primary listening position, known as the sweet spot, directly between the monitors around a third of the way from the front wall. With smaller monitors, arrange the listening position to be around three feet from the speakers, forming an equilateral triangle. This is known as near-field monitoring, 
and it helps to minimize interference from room reflections. With a decent setup, you should be able to trust that what you're hearing is what others will hear when they listen to your work. Next up, I'll begin going through studio equipment, starting with the computer. 